Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So I thank the Finance Minister for his wrap-up speech. I have three clarifications. Before that, just a very short uh, sort of a response or preamble. I think the Minister talked about what, how much the PIT, the personal income tax, would have to rise or the property tax would have to rise to fill the hole if GST was not hiked. So I want to clarify that when my colleague Professor Lim outlined different proposals for revenue generation, uh, that was never the intent, that the entire burden of plugging that hole fall onto personal income tax or onto property tax. So, you know, with respect, I think the view that we are putting forth proposals that soak the rich is a mischaracterization. In fact, it's a caricaturization of what we have put forward. The bulk of revenue generation in those proposals actually fell on the changes to the land sales, the changes to the NIRC, and also the net uh, effect on corporate tax take from compliance with the BEPS regime, not a discretionary increase in corporate tax, but what, how that would impact the overall corporate tax take. And I think our point there is uh, that- Mr. Pereira, if we can come to your clarifications and questions, please. All right. Um, let me move to my first uh, clarification, which is uh, I had an exchange with the Honourable Minister, Mr. Lawrence Wong, uh, in this House in 2018, and I asked the Minister uh, at that time, what would be a reasonable time interval you know, uh, when we review these rules governing the reserves? They were amended in 2008. They were amended again in 2015. So what is a reasonable time interval? Are we saying that you know, it is set in stone and we never amend it? And the Honourable Minister's reply to me at that time was, you, know, you never say never, and these things do have to be reviewed at a, at a certain point. So my question is, what does the Minister think is a reasonable point in time when we review these rules as we've uh, suggested? The second clarification is on the concept of an optimal uh, level of reserves. I would invite the Minister to agree with me that as the absolute level of reserves increases in dollar terms as a proportion of GDP, you know, we must accept that it is legitimate to bring into place policies that slow the growth of that reserve without depleting it. You know, and on that note, would it be the case that the Minister rejects altogether any notion that there is an optimal level of reserves and we keep adding to the reserves ad infinitum? without any uh, regard to the absolute level and its relation to GDP. The last clarification is uh, the minister alluded to the fact that you know, when we make suggestions about the reserves, about land sales, about NIRC, there's a certain sort of a cavalier mindset involved in doing so. I'd like to ask him, you know, the PAP government in this house uh, did exactly that in 2008, and they did it again in 2015. Was that cavalier? And if that wasn't cavalier, why is it cavalier when the Workers' Party now suggests doing that? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, on the three points, um, the first, I recognize that the Workers' Party suggestions for revenue alternatives um, could entail mix and matches as they have highlighted, a bit from here, a bit from there. Uh, but I still say, as I have highlighted, the sums will not add up. Why? Basically, you are asking to tax more from three possible groups as an alternative to GST. The wealthy, the better off, large companies, and future generations. So it's, that's what it comes down to. The future generations would mean land sales, NIRC, these sorts of changes, and I've explained why we do not think it is financially prudent to do, make those changes. Large companies, I have highlighted, this is contingent on the evolving rules around BAPS 2.0, and even if we were to get some additional revenue, we are very likely to go, have to reinvest back to strengthen our competitiveness. This me with the third group, from wealthy. And that means wealth taxes, which I've explained can be difficult to do, or property tax, or personal income tax. And if you were to go home in on property tax, I've explained how it's, if you want to get another billion dollars of revenue from property tax, you have to literally almost, you pro probably will have to double property tax rates across the board. That's just one billion. GST is 3.5 billion. So where does the money come from? And that's why I highlighted the sums still do not add up. I appreciate these, uh, take it in good faith, that there are these different options that the Workers' Party has offered as alternatives. We've studied all of them, 
before the budget, during the budget debate when these options were raised, we went into them again with my team, but we still are not able to make the sums add up. Um, the next two questions, I will take them together. You know, when it's the next reasonable interval where we might re review our reserves rules, is there an optimal level of reserves? It's very hard to answer these questions because I don't have a crystal ball. Um, and really, who knows what will happen to the world in the next 30 years or more? Really, can anybody predict? It's almost impossible. So what, what will trigger us to change? I think it will have to be a something really very disruptive, not just once off, but on a permanent basis, and we'll have to study the options very, very carefully at that point in time, because there are deep, deep implications if we were to change anything on the reserves rules. Deep implications for intergenerational equity, essentially resulting in our next generation having to pay more taxes, as I said, and having less to deal with any emergencies in the future. And that's why I would say not something we do today, because we have other options. We have the GST, which we can implement in a fair way. We have other tax options. And that is the reason why I ask and I said, you know, I, I wonder, maybe this is taking it a little bit too lightly, because why turn to the reserves when we have all these options and why make the GST into the last resort? But reserves, okay, future generations, never mind, let's do it. But, res but GST cannot touch. Why? Why take that approach? Especially when the way we have implemented the GST is not the way the Workers' Party has characterized it. It is not. And you know it too. I've shown the charts. I've explained it. We have explained it before in multiple times and we have reiterated our, reiterated our explanation. So if you understand this, then why, is, why are your proposals anything but GST increase? Even reserves can be touched, but not GST increase. That part, honestly, I can't understand. And it makes me wonder why um, you know, the Workers' Party cites the excuse that, uh, or cites that you know, the GST increase will hurt the poor. It doesn't. I've explained it. And on that basis, they say they cannot support the budget. But really, you know what you are saying then? You don't want to support all the things we have in this budget to uplift the wages of lower income workers, workfare, progressive wages to help vulnerable families with kickstart. You are rejecting all of that. I find it hard to understand, frankly, on the misguided view that GST hurts the poor, which it doesn't. And I can only, therefore, ask whether you are taking things too lightly or whether you are raising this in opposition because of other reasons, political reasons, um, or other things, as opposed to seriously looking at the facts and doing what's right for Singapore. I mean, the Workers' Party is entitled to their views and to, you know, not supporting the budget, but it will not stop me as finance minister from doing what is right, and it will not stop this government from continuing with all our efforts to build a better Singapore.